So I had a, um, a project called Breaking the Climate Deadlock that I've been working on for the last two years. And in the course of that, one of the reports that we produced was about the potential for technology um, to, to resolve these, these challenges. Not just in terms of climate change itself, but also in terms of energy security as well. I think these are the two big, big drivers um, of, of, of this whole policy space. Now, what I think, however, is fascinating to me and a challenge and something we need to resolve is that the public policy space and what's going on on the technology side, they often don't have the right interaction or dialogue together. Um, and so what people, and some of the people that you will see this, uh, this morning who've got amazing and exciting uh, potential disruptive technologies in um, the, the, the energy area, um, they need to know what's going on in the public policy space. But likewise, those people who are policy makers, particularly after Copenhagen, and we know all the challenges there are, both here in this country, but also elsewhere, in making that process work. The policy makers need to know what's going on in the technology area. So, as, um, as, as, as I said to Vinod and his, his colleagues, because, uh, you know, I'm neither a technology expert nor a financial expert. However, what I do know is about the politics and the public policy side of what's going on. And although I frequently find in the conversations I have with Fanon and his, his colleagues that, that I have to contemplate the vast expanses of my own ignorance, um, nonetheless, uh, I, I am increasingly and crucially aware of the fact that the answer to these twin challenges, climate change and energy security, lies in developing the technological solutions of the future. If we don't do that, we won't solve them. We're not going to solve them by telling people that they, they can't live in a world where they're, they're able to consume. But what we can do is show people how we can consume differently. And that's what it's all about. So I'm absolutely um, thrilled to play whatever small part I am in, in what is uh, uh, an extraordinary set of companies uh, with an extraordinary leader. Thanks a lot, Tony. I, I must say that in our interactions with Tony, he's been very, very into the details of the various companies. And we'll hear more about that later. You know, what we often hear about a criticism of clean tech is that public policy equals subsidies, and that without subsidies, there is no clean tech. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Well, most, and, and this is something Tony and I have discussed a lot, most parts of the world don't have subsidies. And if you're building a global company, you cannot invest on the basis of subsidies. We've often talked about the fact of, of, that I referred to the Chilea price, the price at which all developing countries could adapt the technology without subsidies and while competing against their fossil alternatives. Almost every technology we invest in hopes to and expects to get to that point within five to seven years after starting production so they can scale down. Whether it's subsidies or incentives or quotas, uh, portfolio standards, they help a few companies get started when they don't have scale. But any company that relies on it is not something that is of interest to us because it doesn't really solve the problem, it doesn't scale globally. Tony, you talked uh, you know, talk about the tenure price. Tony, one of the things that you've been quite vocal about is that in the coming years, China is going to continue to be one of the more dominant global economies. And how, how do you see these young technology companies playing in China? What would be your advice to them? Um, well, one very interesting thing about this is that if you, and this is the problem for policymakers, when you look at the facts of what are going to happen over the next 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. um, the whole purpose of global policy is to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And yet you're going to have through the industrial expansion in China and India, probably 70% of the power plants are going to be coal fired. Um, one of the reasons why the public policymakers are looking at carbon sequestration and storage is because um, unless we can resolve, as one person put to me actually in, in, in India, one of the policymakers, if we can't resolve this question, I don't know what you're I don't know how you're going to resolve the global issue. Now, one of the technologies we'll be looking at today is something that manages to sequestrate the carbon and turn it into cement, right? which is going to be, obviously it's a major disruptive technology if it works. So this is why, you know, when you're, you're thinking of the future here and what we might do, 
the implications are enormous, not just for our own economies, but particularly for the emerging and developing economies, which will produce the bulk of emissions. And if we can't, these countries are going to grow. You know, they're not going to stop growing. So China and India are going to industrialize. The question is, can they industrialize in a way that is, is sustainable and compatible with the, the, the challenges of the environment? Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, we've talked a lot about is how um, this is right now the problem of the industrialized countries. And how do the rural countries, the countries that are more of an agricultural-based economy, get involved here? And, and we think about shifting GDPs. Well, uh, I, I actually, when I started looking at the problem uh, of energy, was considering another alternative problem, which was poverty, in deciding in the year 2000 which one I should spend my time working on. Um, I chose to work on energy because it is a solution to poverty. I personally believe, and this is where my interest in biofuels came from, that if in fact we can put all the money we are putting into oil into biofuels production, we can do more for Africa in native income generation capability than any other single economic program we could adopt. Uh, it is also true of rural India or rural China. If you know most industrial technologies increase urban and industrial GDP, they seldom increase rural GDP. This is one of the few technologies I've seen that can create that balance and see rapid growth, maybe almost a trillion dollars a year going into the rural economy in replacing fossil oil. Yeah, can I just lean on from that as well? I mean, in the work that I do in Africa, we work in three countries at the moment, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. But in each of those countries, quite apart from all their other challenges, the challenge of energy is absolutely enormous. So if you go into the rural schools there, they have no electricity. As a result of that, the kids are unable to learn in the way that they, they, they could, given the information that's available, if they, if they have the, uh, the power. But also the adults, who also need to get education, to come. You know, they can't learn except in, in the hours of light. So it, it, if, if you're able to do, one of the things that excites me about these technologies is that they are disruptive, not simply in a technological sense, but they are, they do change the rules of the game in terms of development. How, how do the, these guys go about implementing this in Africa and rural parts of the world? Well, I think if you have the technological answer, you can very easily work out the means of trying to, for example, in relation to biomass, trying to try to ensure that that is utilized. Um, I mean, the, we also work obviously on the processes of government and the capacity of government to make sure the right decisions are taken. But essentially, many of these, these countries, the types of, of technology that we're talking about today, they would benefit enormously. Um, you know, things like not just biomass, but solar new technologies in, in this space as well would make a huge difference to them. So, um, you know, I think that, that there is a, if, if you if you analyze this this area, and this is where I think the public policy makers need to get a, a sense of what is possible, you can operate in respect of three things. Obviously, the challenge of, of climate change and the environment, um, energy security, and sustainable development. You know, in our portfolio, you mentioned earlier, it's quite diverse. And as you hear Tony talk about the different things that he can bring and help us take these technologies to the rest of the world, talk a little bit about the diversity of the portfolio and how you think about it. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, what has surprised me is the diversity we're dealing with. And because of that diversity, how much we need advice like Tony can provide. Frankly, in so many areas of policy, just understanding the, the implications of innovation uh, on policy and of policy on innovation is something I would never have guessed five or six years ago. And that's where even the, this ability to pick up the phone and ask Tony for advice would be invaluable to us and to the entrepreneurs.